Before I begin with my own, just a short comment. Because you work at CERN. Okay. Yeah, so sometimes I make these loving jokes about the engineers in CERN or when I'm in Chile and teach there in the Akatama, Akatama Desert, there is that planetarium where they have the X-ray telescopes and these scientists are, I would almost say, more spiritual than we can be spiritual. They see the universe is unfolding and destroying just by looking through it. They see field movements and research about it. So whenever I ask them, how do you translate that home? Are you coming home and saying, my dear, I love the beauty of your field? They say, come on, you're a scientist. <laughs> so I always miss the transfer into that personal life. So and let's see where we go with it. Because well, as you already may become aware, I'm a psychotherapist and a practitioner. And I try to be as practical as possible. We date existence of our planet back about 4 to 4.8 billion years. And life and fossils date back to 3.5 to 4 billion years. In April, I presented on the Science of Consciousness Congress in Arizona. Maybe some of you know that Congress. Very, very. And I held a piece of the Earth from that time in my hand. Bruce Damon, who is a scientist in Santa Cruz, brought a piece for the interesting feeling. Because you remember when Federico said a stone cannot have consciousness. I'm not so sure about that. The only thing is, of course, at different levels, you know. So, and human life species uh, dated 4 million years with a new finding of possibly 6.7 million years. And the so Homo sapiens, the wise man that we belong to, exists for about 150, 200,000 years. And 150 years, 150,000 years ago, humans were possibly capable of speech, again with speech. <laughs> and also on the science of consciousness congress, there was Noam Chomsky and reflecting on the development of consciousness through speech. Then the earliest, well, that is 140,000 years ago, we find evidence of long distance and trade, which documents the capacity for planning and conscious social interaction and exchange. So there's a shift going on. From the earliest uh, beads from ostrich shells uh, used as jewelry dates back to 110,000 years. And my question here, because I also studied anthropology, does this reflect an early emergence of personal appearance? How do I appear of beauty, of play, of pride, or, or other? Then a quantum leap took place, and about 50,000 years, we find more complex hunting techniques leading to clothing from animal heights. Of course, there's a protection against nature, but also maybe as an early beginning of privacy and personal boundaries. Another level of reflection on consciousness. But most important, we find ritual sites of burials and a bit later expression of art form in cave paintings. That means the beginning of a sense of a larger connectedness and imagination, which is a non step in conflict. And with the earliest finding of writing then, about 5,000 years ago, we find another complexity in forming thoughts and more reflection on meaning. Throughout all these times, and with the Sumerians of Mesopotamia and the world's first literate civilization, we have advanced in the contact with consciousness and contributed to it, since we live in a participatory world. I was fascinated when I found this uh, in a magazine, The Oldest Inhabited Cities. And as you can see, there's Damascus and there's Aleppo among them. And on the other hand, we know what's happening today in Damascus, Sea of Palmyra, what happened with temples they get destroyed, and 
or then some maybe know this picture from Second World War, but this is 2018. How come that 100,000 years of accessing and cultivating consciousness is who we are, where we are? And as human beings, what I say as participatory human beings, we have the power to create and the capacity to destroy and to distort. The harmonious flow of energy and consciousness and the flow of light and love. Then we got, of course, ask how do we do that? And how can we support that healing and brought into the world, not just by great ideas, but by practical living? So for that, I give you just a short explanation for the next day exploration. Take the hand, and if you have active hand, and make it fist. If you're right hand, take the right hand. If you're left hand, take the left hand. Make it a good fist. And become aware of the muscles that are activated. I would not ask for the Latin name of the muscles. So, that is a maybe some of you can tell me which muscles you perceive. What do you feel? Action. Action, yeah, but just anatomically. The hands, the lower arm, the upper arm, biceps, triceps, what else? Does somebody feel in the chest? Yeah, the trapezius, maybe also latissimus. Who feels it in the belly? And if I ask you, how's your breathing? What kind of thoughts can you have with the fist? Huh. And let that show your neighbor what kind of thoughts you could have with that. Right. 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 Yeah. So, that is how you structure, no, no, keep it, keep it, keep it. How you structure physically, how you structure emotionally, how you structure in thought form. And then with the next out breath, just in slow motion, take 10, 15 seconds to gently begin to open the hand and see what happens in your body, when you're breathing. And when you gently open your hand, you may even can become a gesture, invitation, and if you direct it to your same partner, you may even become aware of the color of the eyes this time. <laughs> because the research shows in anger people don't recognize the color of the eye in the other. So, yeah. So what have you done in two or three minutes? You have restructured reality. You have restructured the feelings and the attitude and the set reality. I have a wonderful quote for that uh, from Hermann Hesse. If you haven't read Siddhartha for a while, that's a, still a good thing. So, all this little, simple, foolish, but tremendously strong, vital, passionate urges and desires no longer seem trivial to Siddhartha. For their sake, he saw people live and do great things, travel, conduct wars, suffer and, and endure immensely. And he loved them for it. He saw life and vitality, the indestructible, and Brahman in all their desires and needs. These people were worthy of love and admiration and their blind loyalty and their blind strength and tenacity, with the exception of one small thing, one little thing. And that was the uh, consciousness of the unity of all life. That would be just experience, and that what we just saw in the development of our last 4.8 billion years. My near-death experience when I was five years old, and my decision to come back, initiated my path to search for meaning, and to fulfill my intention that I formed experience to bring light into people's lives and lives, which led me to work in the spectrum of spirituality and science and everything and it led me to a scientific attitude 
that everything I cannot disprove may exist. This is the scientific attitude we need. And this search led me then out of the spiritual teacher all over the world, from our window to Krishnamurti, which has been my most influential contact, but also to shamans, scientists, practitioners, and of course culminating in the work with Professor Hattenberg Spock, and of course with Irving Lassner here, and teaching my own institute for energy and consciousness and uh, core evolution. Where the integrative body oriented mindfulness center psychotherapy besides practicing them. So, my question then has always been how do I direct energy? Just last week I was on a congress in St. Petersburg in Russia, on a uh, transpersonal psychology congress on tools for evolution. Even in the transpersonal scene, the hunger is now for tools. We want to know what are we doing, how can we shift things. Because we have such a vast knowledge, but how do we facilitate and uh, catalyze the paradigm? So Krishnamurti challenged me to continuously inquire into myself, my thinking and my action. As a result of, of that so far, I see consciousness as an active process where actual and potential information are mutually transformed into each other and as we will see later, it is a participatory process. My David Wong's expression, in some sense, man is a microcosm of the universe. Therefore, what man is, is a clue to the universe we are enfolded in the universe. For our further reflections, why are we touching the quantum physics, we got to realize and contemplate that quantum physics states that at the most basic level of the universe, events involving the smallest particles like electrons or protons only occur once they are observed. Which raises the question, do I create or initiate consciousness in my world? Max Planck suggests that the material world may be derived from consciousness and not the other way around. So does that mean consciousness creates me? If consciousness creates a material world, then it may not depend upon this or another world to exist. The conclusion would be that consciousness doesn't need a brain to exist. And if consciousness does not require a brain, it may continue after the brain stops working, independent to attach to another device or another form. So with all these discussions that we have these days in quantum physics and consciousness, some questions still remain. Does every material form or appearance have an energetic mode? That means that form really emerges from thought, thought field or other fields? That's an important question for all the questions we have these days about healing, about how to change your psychosomatic condition and so on and so on. And it's not so simple. According to the first thermonuclear law, energy can not be newly created. Therefore, the emergence of consciousness or shift of consciousness can only be a transformative process. Or, like we heard from Jude, maybe we need to look at the law of information, not so much anymore, law of the dynamic. Here we need to also check is it a composition then of oscillating waveforms, as Lakowski described, and that all new information is a modulation onto a baseline. The only thing is that here, the baseline is us. And therefore, the process with us is influenced by internal organismic functioning, social interaction, and countless cosmic information representing an ever-changing energy pattern on numerous levels of existence, therefore a never-ending symphony of life in which you are the conductor. And now you say, heal yourself. A very easy statement. And Brigogin lays out in his book, Order Out of Chaos, 
in a system far from thermodynamic equilibrium, a microscopic order can arise spontaneously. That means without being directed by an outside force or by a blueprint. That means in that case, the self-organized structure is itself creating a field. You may know the picture of the fractal that we saw 10, 15 years ago, how they formed shape, ended out in chaos again, and formed new shapes, you know. So the self-organizing structure is itself creating a field, and in this moment, a process of creation and manifestation is set into motion, and the emergence of a field will be inseparable from the structure that it's created. It's a dynamic, interdependent process. And David Bohm, whom I met in the conversation with Krishnamurti in the 70s and the 80s, and the dialogue that they had taught these principles, the whole of movement, a dynamic phenomenon out of which all forms of the material universe flow. For a human being, this will be the creation of the body-mind field, as I call it. When I talk about the body, I always mean the body-mind field. What does that mean for us on the personal level? What does that mean for you, for you, for you, for me? Before I go there, I would like to share a personal experience that uh, demonstrates the principle that I have. In a deep moment of centering, I find myself on a gentle mountain slope in China or Japan, overlooking rice fields in the long green valley. I'm in a state that I call a perfect stillness, a state between lights, in an energetic equilibrium. There are no desires, no attachments, no I, no time, no movement, no physical perception of existence, not even flow. It's just potential. A monk comes up the hill and the spark of light emitted from his eyes invites me and I answer by taking a breath that activates my potential and in this decision-making moment I agree and decide to follow. On gentle slopes in my vision he guides me further down the mountain until, we, until he departs and I reach another pass and uh, that I follow and soon I see a wooden structure of an old Zen monastery about the 12th century. I step inside and become aware that all the rooms are empty. I didn't realize it was still very strong. So, still needs a little bit more integration. So, the rooms lead out to a large wooden deck overlooking the valley. I sit down meditating and open for the information where it will be. That's where the experience ended. So I revisit that place sometimes, not only because I do Zen, because sometimes we have the question in life that nothing can answer, not even psychotherapy or, or quantum physics. The later then I realized that from a state that I see between lives, an activating moment of the potential took place. Remember the light in the eye of the monk and that I affirmed with my intention and breath, activating my intention into a movement. Because in that moment the formative powers of manifestation were set into motion and informed the structuring of my system. That means the awakening of the consciousness of my body mind field. Today we apply the same principle in neuroprosthetics, in biomedical engineering. Possible. I have a short video, but by time I will not go into that. You can see that it's direct that mind field or activates movement and structure. So from the survival of the strongest. We have moved to the survival of the fittest in social skills and we talk about the development of social brain these days and by that uh, we mean, we had a whole conference here in May in Luca on bonding and early development and so 
on, so we're not go further into that. But by that we mean developing the social brain, developing, creating an environment to further healthy bonding and a safe ground of being, which support interconnectedness, heart feelings, empathy, compassion, and the knowing of the unity of all life and existence. Qualities needed to catalyze another paradigm shift. And how does it reach the individual person? How does it reach the individual? To approach a deeper practical understanding of this, I want to look with you at the cycle of life that I described in my world of evolution and gave you a brochure about that right now. So somewhere in space, an intention is formed that manifests into the human body and follows a journey, wishfully born into gentle hands without medication, into the continuity of a protected space that continues that, co that protection from inside to the outside, breastfed when wanted or held in benediction. I wanted to bring some men in here, all the better. Breastfed when wanted, of course, held in loving presence and the field of loving communication. So it can prepare us for the adventures we are looking forward to in life. Looking further into that process, we got to see that my work comes from the pulsation of life, and I mean the actual pulsation. You know? And basically, we got to understand that life expresses itself with pulsation. Whatever is a life pulsates, and in this dynamic, we bring our essential qualities. And, of course, we develop them into a body, emotion, feelings, cognitive capacity, mind, that we execute them in our life and through the will. All of this and the consciousness of the personality, which, of course, is always limited. Because it really depends on the quality you bring, your genetic makeup, your family, your social setting, your race, religion, etc., etc. All filters that we built to see and experience the reality. But nevertheless, now we can observe that the interaction of our body reactions, emotions, feelings, and the cognitive capacity and the brain allows the mind to emerge, which then connects to the larger field of consciousness and contributes to this field of consciousness. Therefore, the consciousness of the body cannot just be in the brain, but it is in the whole body mind field. So every person is a matrix of body, emotion, feelings, thinking, mind, and consciousness. And our word for the address is not in the body mind field. You see a similar picture, the only thing the hat man doesn't have much about grounding, so they cut you off here and you can leave the legs out, you know. I mean, this is of course graphically a nice version, for sure it's not happening like that. It's really more like fog light energy that constantly moves, is in constant action if you learn how to see energy or have it been gifted. So Einstein described it already very clearly. There's no place in quantum physics for the field and matter. For the field is the only reality. That means we are vibratory beings in the spectrum of subtle energy and dense matter. Here we are more in communication, and that's where it comes closer to reality. And you see a similar, similar picture with Jew. So if you put yourself in the middle of a circle, and I have for all of these exercises, but to make an experience, because what really is needed is an experience. So that is not a belief system, what I tell you, but it's something you know, it's an experience. That's what will create the shift. But since we are so advanced here, I can move on. And because it's clear that the brain has a role in mediating consciousness. Because the brain is not to think, not what to think, but it mediates all processes in the system. And so it's mediating consciousness with it. 
since it's a great way also experience dependent. But the brain of wired to hands on interaction with the physical world. So it's experience dependent, but only in a limited way it takes part in creating personal consciousness. And here we also have to go beyond the brain. I know you have a great meeting always beyond the brain uh, and other factors uh, that run independent of the brain. For instance, like spinal reflexes, like the enteric brain, in which lie 85% of our serotonin and 50% of our dopamine production. Or at the University of Helsinki now, they discovered only a year ago the meningeal linings in the brain, just around the outer layer of the brain, as a network of lymphatic vessels that is directly connected to the lymphatic network elsewhere in the body. And we know that water can store a lot of information. Now we come to another topic, information in, in cells, information in, in water molecules, and so on. So it's all lectured by itself. Well, how about vital cells? which makes up 50% of our cells in the brain, but they don't hold electric charge like the neuron, and therefore they cannot really be observed in their functions like neurons. So if we could possibly discover other systems beyond the brain, when we research with an open mind. I bring this in because in the world of psychotherapy and reality, everything now tries to be explained with neuroscience. That's a new mantra, you know, so you see some oxygen uptake somewhere in the brain and it says, there we have it, that's what's happening. As Mark already quoted, correlation is not causation, you know. So, and that's what we got to look at. Eric Kandel, who got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of uh, neuroplasticity, so to say the Pope of neuroscience, you know, he described in his university textbook, Principle of Neuroscience, we do not know so far how the firing of a specific neuron leads to a conscious perception even in the most simple case. That means that so far we lack a completely inadequate theoretical model how an objective phenomena, like an electrical signal, and the person brain can become a subjective event like pleasure or joy. Maybe, I don't know, are there neuroscientists here? Maybe some neuroscientists who come home maybe say, Honey, I feel an oxygen uptake in my ventilated mental area. <laughs> that means I like it. <laughs> because we have, we have now the documented in the BTA, in the rental and mental area. There's a lot of activity when you feel love. So the new research, where's the seed of love, you know? Yeah, so Yeah, so that's, <laughs> the last two years, I have been invited to four congresses to lecture on love. Very exciting, even scientific congress, you know? So the topic of love has been very much on the forefront. But the first thing we gotta do, we gotta take it out of any romantic meaning. And what's left then? I come to that later. So, however we know from our own life and confirmed by developmental psychology and bonding research that any energetic impulse that does not get harmoniously integrated into a system and interferes with the free flow of life can become form-giving force. <coughs> and we hold that this image of these experiences as representation, as we call it, in our body-mind field. Images in the field of consciousness are psychophysical emotional processes and the energetic impressions into our system. And of course, I cannot compress it to your system if I'm strong in and you feel in the Of course, I also want to find out how can we document this. So, as Harvard says, so how can we find a bridge between just talking about and documenting and how is can science accept it? So, how can we document how emotional, mental or other processes can influence and participate in the structuring of our body mind? 
So for that I began over 30 years with medical Kielian photography. Maybe some of you remember Kielian photography. And here's the medical Kielian photography where you take the meridian flow, hand and feet. You see the radiation. That was then documented by Peter Mandel that, we, that I worked with, the energy emission analysis. But then I moved on to more objective measurement with infrared analysis. So infrared is directly the warmth radiant around your body and that can be taken objectively directly from the surface of your body. So the infrared pictures are demonstrating the existence of a photon field like a pattern on a millimeter pattern like a light scale. The infrared pictures are showing the mental and emotional influences to the field. I worked then with a friend of mine, Medgar Jagger. Uh, we used it for analysis and diagnosis, and maybe some of you have seen these pictures. They went around the world in the acupuncture scene, because they we did that together with the German Acupuncture Society. And but we also documented by reading like structures, they are not easy to see here. So here especially. Uh, so I, of course, have been more interested in what are the emotions and feelings that we make and document in this. And here I want to take this image of that woman here. And you can see, it looks like she has a beard, you know, you know, she is calm, so on. So of course the person sees herself too in the infrared picture that we have with two screens. And then my friend uh, with the doctor said, I have no idea what to do with her. So I said, okay, let me ask her, what do you know about? Has anybody in your family or ancestors ever had a beard like that? And she, of course, reflected and reflected. And she said, you know what? On the desk of my mother, there was always a picture of her grandfather who was very much a patriarch, uh, but made sure that that Everybody in the family going through two world wars in Germany had a place to live, had food and so on. So he took care, but he was a strong patriarch, positive energy of controlling life. She had triple cancer, a relationship is falling apart. And of course, this woman is looking desperately for somebody who can hold her life together. How she identifies now with the image or the picture that she has seen as a child on the death of her mother and with the story, that raises more questions than we have answers, but we have hundreds and hundreds of these pictures and stories. So that then we have become physicists, biologists and so on on board. And every summer now we have a summer academy. I have been in August on the Biophoton Congress in Hamburg. And we always then explore openly what are the principles of life and how can we document it. And I'm always invited for the guy who deals with the feelings. You know. So, in that respect, I don't want to go into the whole case and study, but in general, uh, when we have a temperature difference of one and a half to two degrees, normally the energy flows harmoniously green. Tell you a little bit. This woman had breast cancer, she had an operation. She came into Germany to work with my friend and me. Uh, the operation went very good. You can't see a scar, I have a full body picture, but I never know which environment I come into, so I don't want to show full body pictures. But the scar healed well, the color is very flowing continuously. But here you see cold spots. You see the temperature scale here. They are five or six degree, degrees colder, which indicates immediately there is a blockage, an energy block. So, and you don't see that on the light person. So that means I know from my work it's an emotional scar. And we have physical scars or we have emotional scars. Any scar holds the information of time. And what happens? When we open up the blockage, energy flows. And when energy flows, emotion flow, the story flows. That's why we hold them in there, because we protect ourselves. Any trauma work needs to have a knowledge about it. So 
when we document this situation. So I have a video camera, we have infrared camera, and I do a session sometimes with the people so that I can see immediately the intervention. Maybe even only moving closer to that person, I can see shifts. Or the sentence that I said. So it's an immediate image that we have. So it's a great uh, observation tool, you know. Yeah, and here we have a control picture. And now I mentioned something about the space like I mentioned. In the control picture, now we, we can see, of course, this comes from the tears of crying. But this is the thyroid and the sinus. So I would have to send it to endocrinologists to check what is the hormone balance, it said already contribute to the cancer, etc. etc. For me as a psychotherapist, I feel there's a coldness in the throat and on the heart. You are not speaking your feelings, you are not speaking the truth, you are not speaking from your heart. So when I asked her about the situation that she had, because it happened when she wanted to sit on the lap of her father, who watched an interesting ball game and got irritated and pushed her away and put her hand against her nose and started bleeding, she went into her room crying and decided, I will never ask for any affection anymore. And she did. So that means she not only had a traumatic event, she also lost her father emotionally. So here then, uh, I don't have the picture, no army people I short of the lecture. She reaches out because I ask her, why don't you reach out and ask your father what you would have needed? In a cold voice she said, I have reached out for a long time. And immediately the wrist got ice cold. So I just stayed warm, the wrist got cold and the fingers got cold and cold. So that is what physicists got on the ballot. And that, that defies the quantum principle. Because if you have a, in three, four seconds, such a drop of temperature, that cannot be circulation, that cannot be about the motoric constrictor. So there is an energy withdrawal that has enormous impact. I mean, and everybody who does that with your work and knows that, you can do it this way, this way, that way. You can see immediately when the person withdraws or when they reach out. So the energy is behind it. So here, of course, I will need to bring in Carl Pryram, whom I met in 1974 at the University of Kassel, and his theory of holographic memory, that every cell and cell formation transmits information. And at the very moment of memory, one thing about the brain, the very moment of memory, all parts of an experience, from wherever in the subtle or dense field of the body-mind system, in the speed of light, contributes to recall information, so that the brain and other systems form the energetic information to a gestalt of experience again, that we then may hold as a representation in our system. That, of course, speaks to what's the cellular information. Cellular information cannot be taken part in only by chemistry and by electromagnetic information, it must be by light. And we come to that. So, in a larger context, we translate David Bohm's uh, concept of the unfolding in the holographic universe, in which each part contains the information of the whole. And therefore, we can tap into the memory of all time. That's what we describe. That's right in that month. Mm -hmm. So, in this relation, I would like to share another experience phenomenon in relation to the memories of all time. About 23 years ago, I was traveling in a motorhome through Arizona to visit Hazel Parcells. Philip Purcell had at that time been a 103-year-old healing practitioner of the time. You can see she really enjoyed life, even with 103. She should not so. And in Albuquerque, Mexico. I stopped at Monument Valley to make a tea. Leaning at the car and sipping my tea, looking into the landscape, a wind hits me from the high desert. I intensely listen. My body and all my system is alert. There's a call I have to follow. I jump into the car and nervously drive into the valley and 
and let myself be guided to a part of the valley without people. The wind comes up again and the valley fills with people from a time long gone. A male and a female elder guide a woman in about my age towards me. They speak a language I don't know, but I understand. So the woman and I should be the messengers and go into the world and teach Yeah, teach the wisdom of love and light beyond all cultures and all boundaries and all belief systems. So with a fading image then, I had a deep desire to lie on the ground and complete a vision there in relation to the land. But then another Indian came by with his sheep, you know, and I didn't want to look too crazy at a white guy lying there on the, on the field and uh, trying to connect. So that means it's left a part of the experience still incomplete and to a small degree unintegrated in me, which I later on the document in my biophoton research. But Translating it into my present reality, I realized that in this life I studied ethnology, anthropology, education, psychology, met Professor Pop as a form of research on human biological life, and I teach now on four continents. So I fulfilled that part of my vision. An ongoing process of flow and integration requires the self-creation of a coherent field. How can we support a person in psychotherapy or in any work that you do with somebody, healing and so on, to create a coherent field? Not that you create, but that they are empowered to create their own field. So, in our work of coevolution, we support the stability of a coherent field with the activation and integration of the energy flow into the direct expression of life. Because we know that through all these experiences, that means the attitude of the personality leads to disconnect from the intention of being. It's like, as I said, we come as a pulsating being, and through all our experience, it limits the breath, because with breath we regulate our feelings since we are born. We limit our expression, unless you are Italian, but that is correct. I have an exercise for that too. People love it, especially in America. <laughs> so, we dim down the light. We dim down the light. And that's literally we dim down the light. the communication. Which leads, of course, very often unfulfillment, emptiness, and then crisis. And when a person comes into crisis, they cannot avoid the crisis. Only got a major learning experience by becoming aware of separation and limitation. We have to get through an experience with that person. With then you can perceive the expanded consciousness of being and recognize unity and reality, as we call it in Buddhism. You know, and then of course what I call practice in being. That is that being the practice of being being physically, emotionally, mentally on the level of overall universal consciousness, the practice. Change needs to be practiced. There's no way around it. So with all the neuroplasticity we have, that's only a momentary shift. It's taken three to five months that the neuronal pattern stabilizes. It's always such an easy saying, oh, I changed my brain. Do you really want to change your brain? How? Show it to me, prove me. Where do you go into your brain, you know? So, you got to be more precise about it if you want to be taken serious. So, quantum physics and quantum biology document that cellular information is facilitated by the emission of photons. So, in this way, a person creates a coherence and stabilizes the body-mind field. Coherence, so that means when we have communication with light, neuron pattern, and all the cellular system, <coughs> That can you measure? I have another short video about that with the phrase from Professor Pop. So, about how it can be filmed, even the light between uh, in the cellular communication. 
So coherence is the quality of forming a unified whole with the ability to sustain form and give direction to the energy. I give sometimes workshops I call allow the flow and give the flow direction. Allow the flow and give the flow direction. That's what we gotta do in our life constantly. Constantly. That's what the whole process of mindfulness these days is. So because any destabilization can cause irritation and distortions like fear, PTSD, panic attacks, psychosis and other situations. But to document then how a field can be structured with intention and volition and how the state of consciousness can influence our flow of energy, I connected again with Professor Popp in his lab and his biophoton research. So, I mean, here's this article on consciousness as evolutionary process based on Guardian states in neuroontology. So, because he always avoided, I, I knew him for 35 years, unfortunately he passed away last month. Uh, I knew him for 35 years and whenever I said, hey Fritz, where does consciousness come to the equation? He only looked at me and said, Sigma, if we would use this term, we would be discredited right away. <laughs> but then four or five years ago, finally, and here I knew because he was invited in Princeton, he was guest professor in Princeton, and they had a life science class. In the life science class, they always talked on how can you document consciousness, but it never came to the public. So, here I'm in the photon chamber, when in the photon measurement machine. So, we measure the output of photons into my hand, because the full body machine would be too expensive. That's already happening in the euro. So, first, since I do Zen, I concentrate my energy, so I means my healing capacity, and I direct my light. And then, of course, the physicists and team sits outside and needs to measure it and validate it so that we have a real research. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can see the outpour of photons get measured, and you can see how it's very coherent and very directed and I have a coherent index of one. I have it all together. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> now, I take the image I talked about that I didn't complete in Monument Valley. It doesn't create fear, but it creates still, it's not really integrated in the moment. I don't know what to do with it. One day I would go there again and I would spend a night in the valley or so. And maybe it's not anymore that I need to go there. Maybe I need to sit just with myself and create the space again. So I am looking at it. But nevertheless, see what happens. But the physicist outside them already calls me and said, hey, what are you doing in there? I said, let me do my research and you measure it. In the thought. Similar output, a little bit more excited. But look at the flow compared to this one here. So there is an incoherence and my coherent index is zero. Just to document psychiatry, we know what happens then. The breathing is irregular, eyes start flickering, people get nervous, they have incoherent speech, and so on. All these kind of moments can take place if you learn how to see it. Here we can measure it directly. You know? So and to document what happened in there. And then I got what's in most, but it's very briefly into the gene lab because we talk so much about uh, epigenetics and be very simple and so simplistic sometimes about it. So we had a project there when they got money from the EU to take every three to five years new samples and see whether the environmental uh, situation that may change it. A, we became aware there are so many factors that uh, can never be really differentiated only be maybe 40, 50 that we can put on a question there. And then you need a sequence of about 3 million euro. Uh, and the money was needed for some cancer research in the children department at the hospital there. But what I learned there, I gave a lecture there to the doctors in the hospital. I didn't know they were in the hospital. It's a gene research center they have been talked to in, in Estonia. The university. So after my lecture, the professor had invited me because she was in my training. 
and I asked and I asked the question. Nobody answered. I said, oh, oh that's the end of my career. So, <laughs> but then she said, no, no. Normally, when they're not interested, they leave immediately. Nobody left. Oh, I said, okay, nobody. Normally, when they get bored, they talk with each other, but they take it, they have. Nobody talks. So that gives me a little courage again to ask, you know, I understand I'm not a dream researcher, I come from a different field, but how did the lecture reach you personally? And then a few people said, you know what? I don't really fully understand that, but it reached me really deep in me. But in 10 minutes, I have to go back on the hospital floor where children are dying of some gene disease, and I don't know how to bridge it. That opened my mind how we need to cooperate, bring in a language that we can be accepted, that we reach the people, but then also they need us as much as we need them. So we are in the unity of all being and of all research. So that means we continue to try to find explanatory models that explain that we are all in one consciousness in the holographic universe and can exist simultaneously in the past, present, and in the future physically, you know, we can all explain that. On different levels of physical planes that are connected by wormholes, here we have a painting of the Middle Age about that already, and that's how it's more the modern version. So, <laughs> so that means, so understanding of life uh, that includes will be neat, the courage toward science and understanding of life that includes love and the human light to create a coherent body mind field so that we connect and expand the dimension of consciousness. Because bottom line is the intention to do what we do, to bring knowledge, consciousness, joy, to better the quality of life for all sentient beings and to form intention for this life and to come back can now only be born out of love. For me, love is a resonant with the flow of life. So with that, I take it out of all romantic. And the intention to experience. There are the two motivating factors. The perception of this flow creates pleasure, well-being and joy. So from that aspect, one can understand that life is precious. And in this manifestation and representation of you in this body, at this time, on this planet, in this universe, with this accumulated experience, this is it. There will possibly never be another you in this exact combination of appearance, in case you thought you will complete the next lifetime. We gotta do it now. So some more, I invite you to sense into your essence, become aware of your unique qualities, and realize the potential of all times, of all your experiences, because it leads into the center in the essence, in unity, in the center of oneness. And then, with what I call it, we make decisions from the will of the heart, not anymore the will of the ego. It's the will of the heart, and to celebrate life. In this way, we integrate our past, we are in the present, and we are taking part in shaping our future, catalyzing the paradigm. If you want to visit me in Mendocino, that's where I live. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so, yeah, and then of course we need to transfer right onto the earth we are living on. Fascinating how we spend billions and billions to research our planet, that we make an inhabit when this one is destroyed, you know? Yeah. Instead of using the pillage of mind to keep our planet, you know, healthy, you know? And then to have a larger understanding if your ego and the narcissism can take that, that we are not so important in the whole, and at the same time we are the only one who can change you and me, and we together. 
So in that respect, thank you very much. If you want more information, you can take this. If you have five minutes, you said, and you have some questions. Yeah.